Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with Olympia, Washington-based jazz drummer and author, the great Barrett Martin, on 2022 and beyond. He opened up about his stellar 2021 CD, Still Point, a new studio in the works, the popularity of modern jazz, and so much more. Dig this interview. Is this Joe? Yeah, hey Barrett, what's up, man? Hey, how are you doing? I'm wonderful. How's life? Oh, it's good. I'm just uh, I'm here in Olympia, Washington, and I'm well. I'm starting my day talking to you, and then I'll be working, continuing to build my new recording studio. So that's been preoccupying most of my time. It's not preoccupying. It's totally occupying. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like it. Well. I know before when we got together, it was kind of a long form. We covered a lot of things, and I'm kind of I'm going to kind of needle in a little bit more on Still Point and what what what's coming up. And you're talking about the studio and kind of from that vantage point. And man, the other day we were getting ready to have a storm here in Kansas City, and my son sometimes just says to me, "I need to listen to jazz." He's 17. He's special needs, so I pop in Still Point, and I I was just mesmerized, you know, from front to back. We must have listened to it two or three times as that storm was mounting, and there was just so much good energy. And what a wonderful sound. I'm, I'm just blown away by that album. Wow, thank you. You know what's cool about your story is that I wrote and recorded that album in a house that my wife and I had rented. And it was a temporary thing because we were both writing books, and we rented this house that was literally on a cliff overlooking the Strait of Juan de Fuca, and we saw so many storms come in from the north, like these Arctic storms that would come in from Alaska and, and northern Canada and, and blow across the water, because it was a super dramatic place with, with really radical weather patterns and, and wildlife, because the area where the house was was on a, on a um, what do you call it, a, like a wildlife sanctuary and a green belt that, that went along the coast. And so it was just like constantly like wild animals and storms and it was incredible. So, so that really influenced the way that I wrote music for that album. Yeah. And it's weird because it was, it was like the big storm. Everybody, it was the first big winter storm that we were going to get. Everybody thought the school was going to get canceled and a lot was going on. So there was a lot of that in the air and I would always look down at the title of the song, and I know we spoke before, and there was just that vibe. Like I understood a little bit more what each of the titles meant, and you had touched on how you had recorded it before. But I just kept thinking it was sublime. There was just that's the word that just comes to mind about that recording. Hundred percent sublime. Oh man, thank you. That's a I love that word. It's not used enough, <laughs> and I love yeah. that, that you think of my record that way. Thank you. Yeah. It's, yeah. Yeah, and I'm chomping right now to, um, to to know what's the next project. What's what's coming up on your radar? I mean, you're talking about a studio, but what's next for you? Well, several things, which I'll kind of tell you in sequence. I have been working a lot in South America on two important recordings. One is uh, I went back to the Peruvian Amazon rainforest and recorded another album with the Shipibo Shamans. Who, who are the, the singing shamans um, from the largest indigenous group in the upper Amazon, the Shipibo. And uh, I've done two albums for them over the years. Uh, they're, they're the people that I worked with when I was doing my master's degree in ethnomusicology, so I did my field work with them. And they, they just sing a cappella. There's no musical accompaniment. It's just them singing, and it's just beautiful, beautiful singing. And I, I recorded them right there in the rainforest, sometimes literally standing under a tree or, or in, a, in a hut, you know, depending on the location. And uh, what was interesting is this time they asked me to find people to collaborate with them because they want people to be aware of what's going on in the Amazon and the destruction and the threat to indigenous people. So I brought the recordings back and I just started asking friends of mine if they would, you know, accompany the, the vocals that I had recorded with whatever instrument they play. So, for example, I got Matt Cameron from... Soundgarden and Pearl Jam to play this. He played this really cool kind of Elvin Jones drum solo to one of the songs, which is called the cleansing power of rain. 
And I said to Matt, I said, okay, this, this sacred song is about the cleansing power of rain. We grew up in the Pacific Northwest. This is made for you. And he goes, yeah, I'm totally hearing this Elvin Jones thing. And he just went out and played this beautiful drum solo to, the, to go along with this song that the shamans were singing. And uh, I've got other people working on songs. Um, Kim File from Soundgarden is working on some stuff. And Jack and Dino, the producer and one of my oldest friends, is working on some stuff. Um, I've got, uh, like, some percussionists that I work with. Like, my wife is a really great Latin percussionist. She's, she's doing some stuff on it, as well as a, a Cuban female percussionist in New York who's working on it. And I... And uh, like, for example, Christopher Thorne from Blind Melon, who's an old friend of mine, is going to play some acoustic guitar on something. And so I'm basically making an album with all of my friends, collaborating with the shamans remotely, you know, recording the album here. But it'll it'll be 100 percent to benefit the shamans and and their indigenous families. So that that's like a producer project. And then I'm also producing another album for the Brazilian singer-songwriter Nando Hayes, who I've worked with for 20 years. Uh, we won a Latin Grammy for his last album. For It was the uh, best uh, Brazilian rock album. And we're doing another album like that where I recorded basic tracks in Brazil and doing lots of post-production up here in uh, Washington with uh, lots of special guests playing on it, Peter Buck, Matt Cameron, um, who else played on it? Uh, Chris Novoselic from Nirvana played accordion on it. So I, it's not, I'm not trying to drop names. It's like, but I know these people from my entire life growing up in the Northwest and playing music here. So these are just the people that I call when I, when I need people to play on a record. Um, so that's like what I've been doing producer wise, like, you know, kind of jumping between uh, a shamanic, Amazon Rainforest record and a straight up rock and roll Brazilian record. Um, but I am working on another solo album, which is uh, just more of my compositions. And uh, since I had Matt Cameron in the studio, we did some double drum tracks together where we played at the same time to create the rhythm tracks for the songs. So I'll be working on that, you know, through the winter and into the spring. So I know that's a yeah. lot of information, but, but that's everything. <laughs> yeah, no, and, and I love it. But, you know, I don't see it as even name dropping. I see what you're doing is you're weaving together kind of an art for me to understand how the musician brain works. It has to feel good for these guys to kind of have projects that maybe deviate from what they're used to. Because I think when you, get out, when you get out of your comfort zone or you do something different or you're not just focused on your stuff, it only makes your project when you get back to it that much more fulfilling or it could add meaning to it yeah totally and you know let me add to that that i also i frequently hire young up-and-coming musicians from the northwest music scene to play on records uh where i feel like their particular talent would be really good so for example i've been hiring this young bass player named dune butler he's got like the greatest name like <laughs> It's yeah. totally like a rock and roll <laughs> name, but he's also a really great jazz musician. You know, he's classically trained, so he plays jazz, he plays rock. And like I had him playing bass when Matt Cameron and I were doing the double drum stuff. He was playing with us live when we were doing the basic tracks. And, you know, he was just like, man, I've, I've, this is amazing. I've never played with two drummers at the same time. And it ends up being, you know, you two guys. So I try to bring the young players in and I bring in men and women to, to get their talent and to give them experience in the studio of like, here's what it's like to work on all these different records uh, with different people that you maybe have never met. Maybe you've heard of them, maybe you haven't, but it gives them this experience. And for example, Chris Novoselic, um, he told me one time, you know, this is like, you know, many years ago, but he's like, you know, I actually not, not, not just bass, but I actually play acoustic guitar and accordion. So if you ever need that on any of the stuff you're producing, please call me. And so I called him twice now I, I've had, or three times I've had him come up and play bass, acoustic guitar and accordion on three different albums. And 
he seems to love it because it gives him an opportunity to play in a in an area of music that he might not normally play in you know and and a lot of these people aren't you know they're not in big bands that are out touring anymore they're you know they're they're kind of here now and so it's fun to just get in the studio and see what people are able to do now that we're in our 50s like okay what what life experience have are you bringing into the studio that's different from when we were 22 years old and forming our first rock bands yeah for sure well and speaking of that you know the fact that we're you know we're older and wiser now and we've come out of this pandemic do you see that you're kind of in an, an are you expediting things doing more things sense of urgency what's been your kind of opera mundi now that we're coming out of this past two years of pandemic and uncertainty i wouldn't say that i'm doing anything different now than I was doing before the pandemic. I've always worked on multiple projects at the same time because that's just, if you're a producer, you know, you're, you're working for other people. So you're working to bring that artist, you know, to the height of their ability and bring out the best performances from them. And you, you have to work around their timetable, you know, when they're available, when they want to work. And so then I would fit in my own projects in between that so I always kept myself busy. But that being said, of course, you know, like I didn't do very much during the pandemic aside from, you know, I made the Still Point album <clears throat> and I wrote the Still Point book, um, started working on some other writing projects, but wasn't able to, you know, be in the studio with people. So as the pandemic started to lift and people were getting together again, I just kind of slowly went back to what I'd been doing before that. and. It's not so much that I feel urgency, it's more that I feel there's a there's an energy and an excitement in people to get back to work. Um and and you know, you've probably seen or read news stories about bands having to cancel tours because the cost of touring has just skyrocketed and people, you know, they can't afford to lose money nor nor should they. So a lot of people aren't touring and they're spending more time in the studio and and working on projects that will come out in the future. So, you know, I, that's kind of what I do. I, I don't have any touring plans either with my band or anybody else, uh, but I am working a lot in the studio. You know, the one thing I was hoping that would come out of this pandemic, and, and I'll kind of paint an example for you. I remember I went to Bobby Watson had this outdoor show and something called Flex Pod, and it was everybody had their cars, they lifted the hatches, six feet away it was totally safe and at one point i walked by the student i had a downbeat magazine shirt on and he kind of looked over at me and he said what's that mean and i was like what do you mean he was like what's downbeat mean and i was like well it's a jazz magazine and usually when you go to jazz shows there's jazz fans well this guy looked like he probably should have been at a kenny chesney show but i was totally <laughs> yeah. talking to him you know and he was there with his daughter and, and I'm kind of thinking, is there a camera here? Is there a joke that's going to happen? And we start talking, and this guy basically said over the pandemic, he started listening to this late-night show, and it was jazz, and he fell in love with it, never listened to it, never had any idea about it. His daughter got into it, so they heard about Bobby Watson. It came, and it was the coolest story. And I kept thinking at that point, and even after that, as we were going through the pandemic, how cool would it be that we get back to roots? Like you are, are into jazz now, and you had a different life before that. Have you noticed that people are either more interested in jazz now or just more interested in whether it's recorded music or seeing live music now that we've gone through the shuttering that we've gone through? I think that, um, yes, there has been a jazz resurgence. Um, and, you know, people have been talking about the the East London jazz scene apparently is quite happening. Um, but I've often talked about when, uh, well, let me backtrack a little bit, because I've always, I've always had jazz in my life, even if I wasn't known as a jazz musician. And I, I only say that just so that for your listeners, they know that I'm speaking with some experience like I grew up listening to jazz with my grandparents old 78 collection of all the big band stuff that they had from world war two. And so I, you know, I played in the high school and college jazz ensembles. I was, tra you know, my, my degree was in, in jazz and classical training. And I had every intention of playing jazz professionally as a young 
man, but there wasn't, I couldn't, you know, I couldn't make a living. I couldn't find anybody that wanted to do it. And I ended up getting recruited into playing rock and roll, which, which was in Seattle in like the late 1980s. And, you know, historically you can see where that went. <clears throat> but then um, I ended up, Oh, you know, there, I always was doing projects that had jazz influences and, you know, would bring in, you know, horn players into Mad Season, for example. You know, I brought Skerrick in to play saxophone or working on a Screaming Trees album. I'd be like, hey, guys, let's swing this in 6-8 instead of like a straight four rock and roll thing. And I always tell people when they ask me about the Seattle music scene, there was this incredible jazz scene going on at the same time that was really avant-garde and there's kind of an acid jazz thing and a hip-hop thing and it was always there it's just that the rock and roll got the spotlight you know the grunge thing is what everybody paid attention to but i just think that music goes in these cycles right you know you see you know it's it's rock and roll for a while and then it's pop or hip-hop and then people are like okay this sounds really stale and you know generic let's get back to the roots thing like you're talking about and they go back to things like, you know, rhythm and blues and jazz and, and you know, kind of roots rock or, or like, um, you know, I don't know, bands like Wilco really inspire me because they're always doing something new, but they're still rootsy, right? They have this rootsy alternative country thing, but they're, they'll experiment with electronics and, and strange sound effects, you know? So there's always bands that kind of point to that. And it makes people go, oh, yeah, like, let's, let's listen to that music for a while. And then a radio station will begin programming it, its programs to kind of feed that interest. And, and all of a sudden, the trends change again. I like that people will, will go back and listen to jazz and listen to classic stuff. You know, pull out a Louis Armstrong record or Ella Fitzgerald or, or a Tommy Dorsey big band or something like that and listen to how sophisticated the musicianship was back then and how, how amazingly they played. And they did not have <laughs> pro tools to, to, to edit everything perfectly or, or auto tune to fix the vocals. You know, they had to sing that they had to play it and you got one take. You're right. Yeah. And I'm always amazed too. You'll hear these stories of like, you know, big bands like Radiohead go in the studio and they'll be in there for like a month or so. And all these musicians, these jazz cats I talked to, it's like, yeah, we were there one afternoon or it spilled into the next day. And it's like they just put together this amazing material in a very short window because not even a day is a day. It's like three or four hours. They get in and they bang it out. And it's just like, I don't know if it's the backbone of being an improv person, but it just seems like there's a, there, there's just such a clarity that goes into that musicmanship, and, and you come out with yeah. something, like you were saying, that's, that's beautiful. But I, I think, too, when you're talking about Mad Season, I think that was one of the reasons why I, of all of that era, that I really loved that album, because it was so layered. There were jazz elements. There were different signatures that went into that soft glow that came out of that album. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's upright... I played upright bass and marimba on one of the songs called Long Gone Day, which... Derek uh -huh. played saxophone on that. <clears throat> and there's vibraphone on uh, at least two songs. And it's been a while since I listened to that record. But, I mean, you know, I was the jazz guy in the band, so I brought that, that element to it. Um, but like I was going to say, just back to what you were saying about quick recording sessions, two of my favorite albums, and they're considered, you know, two of the greatest albums ever made, were recorded in two, two days. So Miles Davis' Kind of Blue was recorded they did an initial session that was one day and then a final session that was a few weeks later and the whole album was done in two days. And the first Led Zeppelin record, the debut album, was done in a long weekend. Wow. You know, and that's like considered not only maybe the greatest debut album of all time, but it's one of the greatest albums of all time. So there's yeah. something to be said about great musicians that just get in there focused and play it rather than, you know, trying to make a record on a laptop and, you know, never really getting anything truly great. You know, the other day, my son Miles wanted to hear some jazz and um, he said specifically Miles, so I put it on and so what came up. And I was just thinking about 
we ha- we know all the players that are on that album, but there's some that are, are kind of in the background, like, you know, Went and Kelly and, and all of that. And I just pulled up on my phone, I started looking at it, and I was just, just dreaming about that session, you know. There's Bill Evans with his head popped over the piano, kind of <clears throat> looking with this concerned look all the time, and, you know, Coltrane's always cool, and you can just hear Miles listening to everything and intently looking into the future. And it was like everybody had their role, and it was just the perfect storm. And I'm still be special yeah. by those 59 photos because it was a short session, and they nailed it. And I even had the chance, fortunately, to talk to Jimmy Cobb, and I kind of just said, because I know he's been asked it millions of times, but what was it about that? And he, I will never forget, all he said was, all we did was play our buns off, and we had no idea what we were doing when we left. Like, we didn't realize we were doing anything iconic. It was just another session, and the world latched onto it. And I think that's the beauty of things that do become iconic, which, funny enough, is the way Seattle became. It was just, that was the era, and everybody was doing what they were doing. It just became what people latched onto. Yeah, and I like that that story you just relayed because <clears> – <throat> You know, I, I, I've been lucky in my life that I have played on some classic records in the rock realm anyway, and they kind of have that quality where, man, we're just playing great songs, doing the best work we can do. You don't know what's going to happen or how it's going to be received, but, but then there it is. It's, it, it can only really be said that, you know, the passage of time and the way the public receives something is what determines what's classic or, or what gets forgotten. You have no control over that. The only thing you can do is show up, do the best work you can do, and and try to make a great musical statement in that time, in that moment, in that place. That's all you have. But you, you, you know, you can't control. I mean, this is this is like classic record business stuff too. You know, you make these great records, you turn in great songs. The record label listens to it, and they're like, "Man, that song, that is a hit song. That is a single." You got to go with that, and then nothing happens. But then, out of left field, some other song that wasn't even on the wasn't even on the short list ends up being the single. It ends up being the hit song. You know, that's the, you just don't know. It, it, it's it's up to history to decide that stuff. You know, and I think about how karma can come around. That uh, movie, Searching for Sugar Man, was it Rodriguez? Rod- uh, yeah, yeah, I, that's a great yeah. movie. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, think about that. Like, when I listened to those albums, they just got overshadowed by Bob Dylan and all of that that was going on at the time. But, man, what he was putting out, as raw as he was and as good as that approach was, the fact that the populace didn't hear it until a movie came out in the 2000s blows my mind. Yeah, and what, and wasn't he, like, like absolutely huge in South Africa or something? Like in, uh-huh. a, in a place that he'd never been to, but somehow the music got there and it resonated with with the people in that place. Yeah, yeah. And, <clears throat> uh, and of course, there was all these weird rumors that he committed suicide on stage and he wasn't alive anymore. But, of course, the movie un, un, unveiled that everything was fine. He just didn't get his due until later on. But thankfully, you know, he did. And, and, yeah. and that's... That's the thing. That's the court of public opinion. You never know when that cream rises and how it's going to do it, like a viral video. Like, how do these things happen? But it's the mystery and the beauty of life, you know. Yeah, totally, totally. I mean, and what's more mysterious than music? You know, it's invisible. You can't see it. It's conjured up out of the thin air by a person or a group of people in a, in a, in a place, and you know, at one location, and it either, you know, flies and resonates with people or even if it doesn't, you know, like one time the, the great upright bassist, he's still alive, William Parker, um, free yeah. jazz bassist in New York. Um, <clears throat> I know his daughter. And one time we got to have lunch with him and I just kind of, you know, listened to, you know, the pearls of wisdom that he had. And he said, he said to me, man, it doesn't matter if you play for 3,000 people or three people. If you affect those three people in a positive way and put the music in them, they will go on to spread that energy to other people because that's what it is. It's a transference of energy. And, and I thought about that a lot because I have played shows where only three people came and I've played lots of shows that were 3,000 people or, or much bigger than that. 
And, and it's kind of true, you know. If you, if you perform to the best of your ability, then that's just, I mean, that's just pure energy that you're putting out into the world. There's also that great story about when the band, the police, you know, the famous band, the police, they were on their first yeah. U.S. tour and they were playing the Troubadour. Um, <clears throat> and and I, I like this story because I played the Troubadour with my solo group and, like, nobody was there except for, like, some businessmen that, you know, sort of politely clapped when we'd finish each song. But the police played there. Nobody was there except for a handful of people in the back, and they invited them to just, yeah, just pull your chairs up, just sit up front here, and we're going to play a show for you. It turned out those were the top radio programmers in Los Angeles at the time. And wow. They, and they played like in a, like a living room setting to the top radio programmers in L.A. without knowing that that's who they were. Wow. And that's how they started to get played on the radio, because they played an awesome show to half a dozen people. That's it. You know, William's wonderful. I got to interview him one time, and he's one of those rare, old, wise, jazz uh, people that just everything they say, you almost want to say slow down because it's so good. Like, it's not just like regular sentences. It's like the Jazz Jedi Council. You know, the, the, one, thing I was th the one thing I would think about, too, that's amazing uh, with, with musicians is that I'll hear, and I've heard this a handful of times, when they release albums, they'll say, I just want someone to feel it, whether you feel good or bad about it, but I don't want you to feel indifferent. That's like the biggest slap in the face. But if you have some right. pendulum that goes one way or another, and that is so profound because that's just the way life is. If you feel strongly about it, you got a pulse. You're, you're in the game. Right. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. I mean, um, yeah, I, I think for a musician, you know, whether it's that, you know, the three people of the 3,000 people, you want people to feel your music, you know, that's the whole, you're doing it because it comes from inside of you, you're inspired to compose and to, to you know, play it, but, you know, ultimately, you know, you have to, uh, you have to give it to the public, you know, there's, there's that saying by um, Aristotle that art isn't art until you give it to the public, so you have to hang the painting on the wall and let people look at the painting and, you know, they're either moved by it or they're not. But if you just do a painting and never show it to anybody, it's not really the full cycle of being an artist. The, the full cycle is when you create the thing and you give it up to the public and you accept whether they like it or not, or, or sometimes they hate it or, or, or first they hate it and then they love it. You know, it's like, it's like Stravinsky's right, right of spring. You know, when they debuted it, there were riots in the, in the audience and there were fisticuffs, you know, like people were so <laughs> disturbed by, by his discordant use of music. And they were like, this isn't music. This is blasphemy. And then, you know, then the next th time they performed it, everybody was like kind of attuned to like, okay, it's this new thing. It's going to be different. And then it was received as, you know, a work of genius. So, so, I mean, that's the weird thing about music. Sometimes people hate it, and then they love it, or, or, or they love it, and then they hate it. <laughs> I mean, it's, yeah. Or, or it, it, the it, classics are, are like something recorded in 1959 is going to be classic for hundreds of years, you know. For sure. Well, Bebop did the same thing. People were kind of freaked out. Like, the old guard cats were like, what's going on? But it, it was the revolution that jazz needed and got. Yes, yes. And it has to For do sure. that from time to time. It has to have a revolution. It has to, has to be turned inside out. I mean, I saw that with, with Seattle, you know, when that Nirvana record came out. Radio station programming changed almost overnight. I mean, within yeah. like a few weeks, it was very different than what they were playing, you know, prior to that. And then... And then it was cool for a few years, and then it went back to being, you know, kind of awful again. It's just <laughs> it's the nature of, like, commercial, commercial radio, you know, swings pretty wildly like that. But, but um, I mean, not, not that radio is, is, is the benchmark. I mean, there's all kinds of places now where people can hear music that weren't available back then. But in 1991, you know, commercial radio was how you found out about music um, or College radio is where you heard the cool stuff before it broke through to commercial radio. 
through. Absolutely. Well, and speaking of getting the music out there, for anyone out there that wants to pick up Still Point, you're, you're a wonderful author as well. Where is the best place for everybody to go to either get existing material or find out what's going on with you? Um, well, the, my books are available both, uh, you know, as printed books and as audio books. So you can, like, if you want to listen to the audio book, it's me telling the stories, like I'm the narrator, and then it's got the music from the album in between the stories. Uh, so you can, you can find that on Audible or any place that sells audio books. Um, the, you know, I've written three books at this point, and they're all uh, either paperback, hardback, ebook or or audiobook like they're in every format so you can find them on amazon barnes and noble um you can order them from any bookstore because i i'm you know i have distribution so the books are available everywhere um and then there's always you know just my website which is my name barrettmartin.com and then i'm on social media so i'm always posting about you know the different projects i'm doing and you know, I'm not a huge social media person. You know, I, I have a good following, but I'm not on there all the time. I wait till I have a really good photograph, and then I post it. I'm not a great photographer, so <laughs> my, probably my standard of what a great photo photo is is different than an actual photographer. But, but I try to post like, oh, I'm in the studio with these cool people. Here's a photo. Or I'm, I'm in the Amazon rainforest. Here's a photo. And, you know, I'll write a little story about what I'm doing and just try to, you know, let pe keep people in the loop without oversaturating the whole thing. Well, Barrett, man, I, I can't tell you enough how much I've really enjoyed this CD. I'm looking forward to putting more material in the future on Neon Jet. Thank you for being gracious with your time and opening up. I appreciate it. Hey, Joe, thank you for having me. I always enjoy talking with you, and um, we we'll really appreciate um, your support as well. Thank you. Thanks for listening and tuning in to another Neon Jazz interview, where we give you a bit of insight into the finest players and minds in Washington State, Kansas City, and spots all over the world, giving fans all that jazz. Thanks to Barrett for always being a beacon of good in the world of jazz and all the stories. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino in the iTunes Store. Visit Neon Jazz at YouTube.com. And for everything Neon Jazz, go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, enjoy the jazz, my friends. Neon Jazz.